cool. I am a Pommy. This is a podcast. Welcome to the Pommy podcast. My guest today is Danielle. Hello. How you doing? I'm so good. I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Yeah. To the to the uh, audience today. No pressure. Go on then. <laughs> 60 seconds. 60 seconds. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm Danielle. I am so grateful to be on the podcast today with Ross. Uh, I've basically been out of prison now for about nearly close on a year. So I've made a lot of uh, positive changes in the community within the last 12 months. So really came to talk about it today. Awesome. So look, before we get into all of that stuff, before we get into all the youth work and the programs that you're running now with Confit, etc., Confit Pathways, talk to me about what life was like growing up for you, because we've spoken a little bit before we went on air and you've got a pretty normal middle class upbringing, right? Yeah. So elaborate a little bit more on that. Absolutely. So things started off so well, you know, I grew up uh, middle class in the, in the North Shore of Sydney. Uh, you know, dad did his absolute best to get us in the, in the private schools and, and sort of living that almost like high class life while never actually reaching that sort of like high class budget, I guess you'd say. So from the get go, uh, from the jump, my sister and I never really fit in to the, to the kind of area we were growing up in. Mm. Um, what, what area was this specifically? So Taramara, so Tarara, North Shore. Yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we went to, we attended Pimble Ladies College. Yeah. Um, my sister, several years older than me, absolutely thrived. She was the sportsman of her year kind of thing, still is actually. But um, for me, it was a different story. I've always been very community based from the get go. You know, I remember, so my sister starting off at this school, you know, she made all the A teams in all of her sport. And then because of who she was, when I came through several years later, all of the sport teachers were sort of like, oh, that's you know, that's Jessica Hogan's daughter, uh, Jessica Hogan's sister, you know, we want to we wanna get her on all the A-teams. And I'd actually decline the offer, not because I was good at, like, I wasn't great at sport, but I'd say, no, 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 like, I want to kick it with everyone in the D-League teams, you know, I want to I wanna bring everyone up. Mm. So that's been my goal since such a young age. I've always been sort of based, based around trying to better the lives of other people, you yeah. know, so... What started off really, really good, really positive. I was always that really chatty ADHD kid. No one could get me to sit down. I was always there for fun and to to bring out the best in people. Uh, really started to derail, I guess, in year eight or year nine. So my dad went through serious bankruptcy uh, to the point where there were a lot of nights that there was minimal food on the table kind of thing. And growing up in... An area like that, everything was very surface level. And yeah. of course, because because my sister and I were so young, you know, my dad always wanted to do his absolute best to protect us. So everything was sunshine and rainbows. You know, there was never an issue for us girls. Obviously, you have that underlying feeling that there was something wrong. Mm. Um, for example, we couldn't go on all the holidays. All my friends were going overseas and spending all this money on stupid shit, yet we were sort of less than. But the one thing that my family had that no one else did was exactly that. It was family, mm. you know? So I, I come from a fantastic support network. Uh, my parents have been there since day dot. Uh, although I've put them through a lot of shit, I was a bit of an asshole for about 10 years of my teenage years. Uh, so basically year eight, I was pulled out, of, sorry, year seven, I was pulled out of a private school due to a matter that a very wealthy mother had created for me and my mother. Um, basically, nearly got me expelled, I guess you'd say. Um, teachers started to view me differently and I was I started to get bullied from that point. So, jumped around. Can you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, basically, this was the year Mean Girls came out, that movie, funnily enough. So, this girl that I had grown up with um yeah as i said very wealthy family parents weren't very present they they sort of paid their way exactly exactly through that like through money so had a very strong financial presence in the school mm. uh you know this mum was always bringing coffees to the teachers and that kind of thing she became very close with my mother so 
obviously I became close with her daughter. Anyway, we went up, we grew up through school together. We hit year seven and this was sort of the dividing year, right? Where your personality kind of holds your place in the school. So I was the one that always brought everyone together. You know, we were known as, I was known as like the popular group with a few other friends and I was always trying to include everyone. You know, there were days we were sitting on this really rich oval at school and we'd have like 30 girls sitting in a circle or we'd all have everyone involved in games and stuff. However, this girl was always excluded. Why? Because she was an asshole. She was basically brought up into a life where, yeah, parents weren't present. They basically paid for her love kind of thing. So I always had a really hard time bringing her into my group of friends. Anyway, obviously she noticed that push came to shove one day and I got called into the principal's office. This was very new for me. Um, this was probably the start of like my criminal activity, <laughs> but, um, yeah, this, uh, this, this book was presented in front of me that basically had things like death threats and really ugly labels and sort of, yeah, all that sort of stuff. And, um, the principal basically put to me that I wrote this entire book, myself and three of the, I'd say like the most popular girls in that year, mm. we collated this book. Obviously that wasn't true. Um, funnily enough, the only people that actually recognized that that book was the exact same theme from the movie Mean Girls, which had come out that year, the only people that recognized that was my parents. And so obviously they tried to plead my case to the school saying, how can you not see A to B? This girl has obviously created this thing to, for, for whatever reason, to get my daughter in trouble, la la la. Anyway, nothing came from it. It got to the point where detectives came in. They took my school diary. They were trying to figure out the handwriting in my diary versus the book. And it just got so out of hand. But obviously there was no proof at the end of the day. So everything got dropped. Um, I stayed there for a couple weeks and then from there, look, financial power was everything at that school. So this is where, you know, the teachers started treating me differently. A lot of the girls were coming up to me, even people from different schools were saying, oh, you know, you, you were sending death threats to that girl I heard and this, that, the other. Anyway, very year seven. So my parents chose to take me out of the school, obviously for for that reason, but also financial reasons, we were struggling severely and we mm. weren't missing, or we were missing a lot of school repayments. So from there, uh, I went to a performing arts school, which turned out so well for me for so many months. So my stream was dance um, and acting, mm -hmm. which I loved so much. My academia went down the toilet, but my performing arts side of things really skyrocketed, which was awesome. But that year uh, I was actually sexually assaulted so when that occurred, I was with uh, one of my schoolmates that was there at the time. So from that situation, I think this is this was my first run in with the courts, and this is where I sort of started. Sorry, sexually assaulted by another student or by no, a teacher? No, no, not by oh, a teacher. So okay. it had just happened from, oh, like okay, while okay. I was at that school. Okay. So basically, one day, um, I had gone to uh, Burwood Shopping Centre and met a bloke there, uh, went for a walk, Burwood Park, push came to shove, X, Y, Z happened. From there, I jumped on a train. Oh, sorry, my friend was actually there just before it had happened. She came up with the excuse that, oh, I need to leave. Obviously, she sensed some form of danger. Um, I need to leave, blah, blah, blah. She left. Within five minutes, I was dragged into bushes obviously XYZ happened. Um, from there, I managed to walk myself back to Burwood train station, jumped on a train, called that same friend and said, shit, like, I, I think I've just been raped. I'm not, I'm not sure, but mm. yeah, obviously I was in a state of shock anyway. So at that point went home. How old are you at this point? 14. Yeah. So I was living, uh, in St. Ives at the time I managed to get I don't remember getting home. I got home, locked myself in my room, and this is where I'd say the first domino, or the second domino, actually, of my life fell. Mm. So This is probably where you're starting to 
I don't know, society is not playing your way right. Mm -hmm. So you're starting to rebel a bit because... That's exactly right. Yeah. You're not... Society is supposed to be this way, right? I've been through the judicial system myself and I realise how unfair it becomes because even if you do go and report this guy, like... I mean, was there any backlash at the end of the day? Absolutely. And this is this is where the whole downfall with the system occurred. So mm. it took me two weeks to come out and admit what had actually happened. Um, so imagine I'd gone from this outgoing, optimist child, you know, who loved the world and the world loved me back to suddenly I fucking hated the world. I didn't understand the world. I didn't understand why something like that needed to happen to mm. me. Like, that's how I lost my virginity at the end of the day. And so I didn't understand it. You know, Mm. it sends you into a spiral of what is this place? Who the fuck am I now? Like, it it really takes a big part, a big chunk out of your identity. So Mm. suddenly I'm back at school a few days later. No one knew at this point aside from um, my best friend at the time. So all of a sudden... The PE teachers actually started noticing my actions were very different. I was very dark, didn't want to engage, just wasn't myself. So she, well, one of the PE teachers pulled my friend aside and said, what's going on with Danielle? I've noticed X, Y, Z. Uh, the same friend who was there on that day obviously broke down and told her everything. And so I got called into the principal's office about a week after that, so two weeks later from the actual offence, and the principal said, I need to know what has happened. From there, she said, listen, either you're going to tell your parents or I have to. So she goes, I'm giving you the afternoon. You know, you can go home however you please. We can get you home, whatever else. Sit down, tell your parents, or obviously we're going to have to involve the police. Yeah. At that point, I went home, didn't want to tell my parents because in your mind at that age you're still this innocent pure that's a very, soul that's a very sorry about it there's a very difficult thing for a teacher to ask of a 14 year old yeah because ultimately if i was a teacher i would be like i have to call your parents to come in yeah like, we have to protect you and we're gonna have this conversation together to make it easier because you as 14 years old how are you gonna i couldn't i like, couldn't that's that's like an impossible task. Absolutely. Like you're already like shook up about the whole thing. You need an adult there to be like, this has just been explained to me. I'm going to explain it to you as another adult. Yeah. But obviously that didn't happen. I think it was sort of the the fear of involving absolutely everyone like in her office kind of thing. I think for me, she sort of thought that it gave me opportunity to speak my piece, to speak what had actually happened to my parents, which obviously I couldn't do because I was fucking 14. So... Mm. I went home, um, I don't even remember this, but my sister actually told me a couple of weeks ago that I told her, because all I remember is the police rocking up and then the reports being done and everything like that. So apparently I would basically, I'd come home, sat down with my sister and said, I think, everything was I think, I think, I think, not I know this had happened. It was, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure that this happened to me. So, obviously, she called mum and dad, said, you need to come home right now. I need to tell you that something that happened to Danielle, which she did. From there, all I remember is police were called. Uh, They came into the house, obviously had to do a report. My dad sat out the back of the house the whole time because I could not even look at him. In your mind, I'm, I'm the youngest daughter, right? So... And I had a very close relationship with my dad, and I still do. But in that moment, you think I have failed them. Like, I'm not this innocent, pure, young daughter that they think I am. I'm tarnished now. Something's happened to me that I can't undo. I can't explain. I can't justify. So from there, that really kicked off a very weird relationship with my parents I'd say for the next few years and then yeah from there it was Do you think did your parents were they able to communicate to you were they in obviously I imagine your dad was in super shock right your mum obviously as well but being a dad myself like I don't know my first instinct is rage right like I'd be so angry about one I couldn't protect my daughter 
to who the fuck is this guy because I'm going to go and get him um, and I think it's it's the way that you say I'm tarnished and it, it kind of it means that the blame's being put on you as a as a young girl that's probably what you're thinking but obviously looking back on it as an adult is different right because it's you're not the one you're not the one that did that yeah. you're the victim in that situation do you know what I mean so you're not tarnished Absolutely. you're not you haven't done anything wrong and You've now just I gone... just want to hug younger me when I hear myself <clears throat> say these words is because it it really set the tone for like the next 10 years of my life you know so having that victim mentality and yeah having growing up in a family that everything was so surface level it was really hard to talk about the hard shit you know, mm. it's only been over the last few years and unfortunately it meant me going to jail for us to open up and be oh. able to talk about all the hard things in life. I understand why my parents did that of really mm. always wanting the best life for my sister and I. But I think moving forward, even when I'm a parent, you need to show the light and the dark. Yeah, you do. Because that's life at the end of the day, mm. you know? So not having that and not being able to feel like I could talk about things, this is where, yeah, this is where the downward spiral really started. So from there, obviously, we went through the whole court proceedings and through the court proceedings, because it took me so long to come out and report what had happened. Two weeks. Two weeks, apparently. Too long for some people. Uh, the guy was arrested. But then from there, all I remember is being in, uh, I was in a private room when it came to sentencing and the, I think it was the DPP, whoever asked the questions, I was just being absolutely annihilated. Like it was like, oh, well, why did it take you so long to, to come out and, you know, create this story? Could I put it to you that you fabricated this story? I didn't even know what the fuck fabricated meant. Mm. You know, oh, you're not or, protected at all. No, not at all. All the only protection that was <clears throat> that existed was me being in a private room while he was on camera. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, Other I think that, I think for anyone, there's is a good point for anyone listening that hasn't actually been through the judicial the judicial system. They don't realize that you are treated like the like you're the one. Yeah, that did like it. you're the one that did you're it the through every single part of the process absolutely <clears throat> i went through a situation where i got into a, a fight an altercation and someone had anyway I've, I've said it on another on the podcast before but that whole time when you stand up because obviously there's defense right and this is what people don't realize that that lawyer is wanting to get their client off right and your lawyer is trying to get their client put in jail or you know whatever you know whatever they're given they're, they're trying to get get you as much justice as possible but <clears throat> i was thrown into a situation and i remember on the stands arguing because i wouldn't shut up and i was like i was like don't think you're like i understand that you're trying to like call call she called me a monster to society yeah i was like how am i a monster to society i'm a stand-up you know military personnel like i fight for this country I've done everything that I should like in this life to be an upstanding role model for other people. And you're painting me out to be a monster to society when your client is the one that started this whole situation. See, like, and it's amazing that you had that, <clears throat> that self understanding, that self worth that you knew to all, hold your ground. But also during that process, your legal advisor at some point wants to come up with a negotiation, mm. which really wound me up. Cause I was like, I don't fucking do anything wrong. Yeah. This is not, I'm not negotiating. Good. Like I did not do this. So, and it's one that you, you do get pressurized. Like I was talking to Russ Manser on this podcast before, right? When he was 16, he went and robbed the car from Palm, what is it? Palm Beach up north, right? He robbed the Porsche. And, you know, 16 years old, involved in drugs and blah, blah, blah. But his legal advice was just take the, take it, right? You know, and that, that sent they him on the spiral. Do you know what I mean? It. But like, I think for a lot of people that have never done anything slightly out of whack in society, right? Or have never been through the judicial system themselves, will re unless you actually go through it, you realize how unfair the whole process is. Absolutely. Because it's just whoever woke up that morning, if they didn't have their coffee, or they felt like they're in a bad mood. Exactly right. It, 
it, it frames their decision process because ultimately yeah. they're just making a decision on the spot, right? Mm. They meet you for f- five minutes, or however long the court process takes. They meet you, you explain your story, they make a decision. And if they're having a bad day, you're getting it regardless. And there's so much <clears throat> biasness of it all, you know? And mm. it, like I'm sure we'll, what we'll talk about later with my, cro- my court proceedings... I just remember, like, not, not the for the sexual assault, but for something I had actually done. I had dedicated so many, like, two years of me being on bail to better my ways, to, to come up with every character reference I could to, to show this judge that I'd changed, that I'd better my ways, that I deserve better, that I don't deserve to be in jail. It wasn't taken into account at all. Mm. It was like he had this... He decided on that morning... I'm going to make sure every single person in that syndicate gets what they deserve. Mm. Doesn't matter what you've done in the last however many years to turn your life around. I'm going to punish you the same way I punished her, the same way I'm going to punish him. Mm. It was just, it was so unfair. It was so, so unfair. Well, we'll, we'll get into how did how did How did this sexual assault end up? What was the, the result? In the Charges end? were dropped. Yeah. And this is what really... It changed so much in my mind because I thought, okay, justice system doesn't give a fuck about me. Money equals power. Exactly right. The getting kicked out of school and all that. Absolutely, the getting kicked out of school, even to the point where the courts made me feel like I was a liar. Mm. So it was because of you you waited too long to, to tell your story. You... And even when you did tell your story, why doesn't your story match up with your friends? Why was she too scared to admit so many things just because she had to get home at a certain point because her parents were one way or another? She fabricated parts of her story, which made it look like I fabricated my parts of the story, despite the fact there was proof. Completely, it went completely unnoticed. So for whatever reason, all charges were dropped. I at the age of 14, was made out to be a liar in the court. So I thought, mm. fuck it, I'm going to be the best liar these people have ever seen. And then that's what started yeah, it's the, knock-on the effect. weirdest 10 years that I think any person could ever encounter. Let's hear those 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> so from there it just started, you know, like I went from, as I said, such a happy optimist, like... Mm. The way that I hear my parents describe me as pre, a child. Pre that, right? Pre that, pre <laughs> that. Fucking awesome. Mm. You know? And I see, don't get me wrong, I see so many traits of that young girl still inside of me. But there's that hesitation. There's that constant, you're not good enough. You're not worthy enough. You're not this, you're not that. And then it's just like piles of trauma started to build on top of that. So after the sexual assault, I had basically met a guy that I had dated for eight, nine, ten years too long. Um, that relationship was very domestically violent driven. I'm talking like ice addictions, verbal abuse, financial abuse, mental abuse, physical abuse. It just carried on. You were addicted at this point. Yes. Until- yes. So... Imagine growing up, 14, 15, mad at the world, I get introduced to pot. Uh, growing up in St. Ives, so everyone was obviously on the bongs around St. Ives in the skate bowl. Makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> checks out. <laughs> yeah. Mad at the world while their parents were making money. So, yeah, we all started to smoke and I started to feel this feeling inside of me every time that I'd smoke of, I'm... Um, like the, the, the negative voices were quiet. I could be myself. I could be this loud, outgoing person. I could I could keep that front that everyone knew me to be mm. of confident, of I'm not a victim, of I'm having fun all the time. I'm, I'm there for a good time, you know? But this continued for so long and only it just got deeper and deeper and deeper. So Smoke and mirrors. Yeah, right. Literally, so what started with pot, <laughs> obviously went on to like pingers, ecstasy, whatever. Then I met Xanax, 
which sent me for absolute six. Um, as people call it, like a prison sentence in a bottle. So I basically built this personality around a Xanax addiction. Everyone thought I was sober. Everyone thought I was straight. Everyone just thought I was still this confident young girl that was was the party girl, was fun, was always having a good time, was always trying to make everyone else have a good time. I was dying inside. I didn't have a personality at this point unless I was off my face. It, it reminds me of some of the colleagues that I used to work with in the military who you would go out on a night out and because you were young, you didn't understand it, right? Looking back on it, I can see someone who's got trauma that because the person that wants to be the center of attention, that wants to be loud and get off their face and be the funny one. And they're the ones that actually need to pull to one side and go, we need to sort you out because this isn't acceptable. Because I've, you know, I've said this before as well, you know, I've friends in the military have committed suicide and they were the funniest guys I knew. But they were the ones. Well. They were the ones that were dealing with trauma. And but to deal with it, it was like, oh, what can I do to just forget about it? Band-Aid. I can go out and get blind and snort and do whatever I need to do to just forget about it. And you know, womanize and all these things that the guys in the military used to do, just so I can forget about what I've done or what I've seen or childhood trauma that they've been through. Which a lot of the guys that join the military. The reason why they're joining is because they want to get away from their family because of the childhood trauma and the shit that's happened back home is why they're joining this this system mm. um but it's interesting that you talk about it this in an area like saint ives because i'm from a what you would call a wealthier area back home right so i'm from nick just outside of cambridge there's a horse racing town called newmarket it's full of wealthy people in the country who've got lots of mummy and daddy have got lots of money but mummy and daddy weren't giving them any love or attention. They were paying for them to go to Cambridge University, uh, Ely uh, King's College, which is all of these private schools that were either all girls or all boys. And it's one thing that me and my wife have spoken about with our kids is, you know, if we're in the fortunate enough position to be able to pay for private school, would we do it? And I just don't think I would. No, nope, I'm sending my kids to a public school and giving them an Opal card. Yeah. Sorry, but from I'm my not experience, it. no, yeah. the things that I've learned growing up in that area, going to private schools, <clears throat> money is nothing. I used to have friends of mine, I still have friends of mine that acknowledge my family's financial situation that still exists very much so today. Mm. But they're envious of us. Why? Because we've had that family unit. Mm. Growing up in these areas, those families don't have that unit. No, they don't. They pay for that unit. Sweet. Send them off thinking that a bit of education will do them good. It's not. You're still giving these kids free range. Like, you need to pull the reins back a bit and help them figure out who the fuck they are. Mm. You know, and that's something I definitely had more so than a lot of a lot of my peers, I derailed a little bit, but I think it was once I hit that rebellious phase, once I didn't feel protected, once I felt that I could sort of, everything was up to me at the end of the day. Mm. I could, I could make this outcome. I could make that outcome. Everything was up to me. As soon as I had just me and myself, I just thought, fuck it. Let's, let's just see what happens. And that's exactly what happened. I've, I have lived so many different life paths. It's unbelievable. It's not something that I would recommend. When people call me like an influencer, I just think this is not something I would ever want. This is not something I would ever expect or want anyone else to ever walk down. Mm. I'd like to lead by example to say, don't do this, don't do that. If you can avoid it, please do so. Yeah. I mean, it, it took me a few years, but... I'm proud now to say that everything that I've gone through, it has now brought me to the career that I love so dearly. My biggest passion of helping people, it brought me home. It brought me back to the, the, the child that I was before any of this shit happened. And it's brought me back to that same goal of wanting to, mm. wanting to help people. The, your story is widely known, right? So if anyone's going to Google your name, they'll see articles of 
you know, this, that, and the other, Coke dealer, all that type of thing. Um, we've heard it before, so I don't want to go too deeply into it again. But when you finally got arrested for dealing, um, do you feel like that was the turning point? Like when you got sentenced, was it 17 months? Yeah, 17 months, yeah. Do you feel like that was the switch in your brain that was like, I've got to fucking turn this shit around? Absolutely. Look, even when I was first arrested, so I was arrested in 2019, and at that point, you think you're bulletproof. You think nothing's going to happen. I can do whatever I want. I can carry out this life however I feel need be. So when I got done, I could honestly do nothing but laugh at that point because I was like, okay, I get it now. That's it. Yeah. You know, I can't and, get out of this. No, way. this is this is probably this was the first event in my life that I couldn't talk my way out of. I couldn't, you know, wiggle my way out of and sort of manipulate the situation because that's what I learned to do, mm. you know, over the last ten years of my life. So upon my arrest. The, the detectives take me into the interview room, show me all this evidence and said, is there anything that you want to tell us? And I laughed at that point. I said, listen, there's nothing you don't know. Like you, you basically know more than what I do at this point. So whatever, like I'm, I'm in your yeah. aid Sweet, Leave yeah. it at that. I was then on, uh, I went to, sorry, I went to Silverwater for two weeks. I then got Supreme Court bail. Uh, I was on bail for two years and most people will think, amazing, that's two years of you trying to change your shit around. That's two years of you hoping and praying that you're not going to go to jail. I think out of everyone, the only the only people that knew within my support network that I was going to jail was myself and my dad. So at that point, all I was trying to do was get myself mentally prepared for jail. Mm. I mean, even if it meant... <laughs> I attended like a few boxing classes with my PT just and I, I told him straight I said listen I think I'm going to jail like you need to prepare me because <laughs> I don't belong in jail and I knew that from the get-go so I kept thinking okay yeah, I'm gonna get ripped apart pretty much pretty much and I kept thinking you know how am I gonna fit in how am I gonna fly under the radar I was going about it the wrong way thinking like that because when I was sentenced I didn't expect to get that long, for starters. A year and a half doesn't sound like much to most, but it is. You feel every single day in there. Mm. Nothing can prepare you for that place. It's not reality at the end of the day. And I actually learned that upon coming out because I basically use jail, no courtesy to corrective services whatsoever. I use that as like a rehab for my soul it brought me back to the person I was before I was a victim of domestic violence, before I was an addict, before I was a victim of sexual abuse. It brought me back to that young girl that only wanted the best for other people and the best for herself, right? So every day I would create sort of like little challenges for myself or I did a lot of reflection in 17 months, but then coming out, it's like you're so confident and you're so aware of yourself and all the moves you want to make. But it is so unrealistic to bring that version of yourself in there back into reality, into your old environment and expect the same outcome. So that's probably been my biggest test for the last 12 months. Mm. During that bail period of two years, it's kind of like you're stuck in limbo because you know... Autopilot, for sure. Yeah, you know a decision is coming you know that it's likely not going to be well you're you're expecting the worst right because you know that okay this in two years there's going to be a decision your life's on hold almost well did you have any were you still dealing and doing absolutely not the second that i got caught that as i said before point. i thought yeah okay like this this was the this was probably well, it was the most serious thing that's ever happened to me. I've never been caught. I have always gotten away with things. For some reason, I've just always flown under the radar. Mm. You know, I've been very blessed in that sense. But I knew that this needed to happen to stop me in my tracks to be like, this is not your life. Mm. You know, every day in there, even out on bail, police rocking up at 
weird hours of the night, rocking up to my family home, waking up my family. It was a reminder for me every single day that this is not the life that I'm going to amount to. Yeah, I've messed up. This is not the... Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And you wear that. It's so hard. It is so hard to wear that thing every day of like, I have fucked up, not just by myself, like Mm. for myself, but for my family. Yeah. That was the hardest. It's a very sort of like shame based element. You're constantly sitting there thinking, okay, how can I, how can I improve? But I know that that wasn't, that wasn't because of the system. That wasn't because of an officer or a parole officer or a, a police officer telling me, you need to do this. You need to do that. That was a decision I made in myself. Mm. And that is the decision that I'm trying to encourage in all of the young people that I'm dealing with now. No one is ever going to make that decision for you that you deserve a better life. You have to make that to yeah. make that happen. It's... Um... It's really good that you've made that decision because there are so many people that get involved in a life of crime and they do get that wake up call and they still fucking blow it up the wall and continue doing what they're doing. Um, they don't see it as a, ah, oh, I need to actually like stick to the rules here and you know, society's not just gonna let me do this. Like I have to, you know, button it up and you know, because it is all of the, it's the other shit that comes with it. So you go to jail, but your parents don't get to see you anymore. You don't get to see your sister anymore or any other members of your family. Your close friends who you also thought were you, your close friends probably, you know, disconnect from you. Um, I mean, the good, thing, the good thing is you find out who your real friends are, right? At the end Absolutely. of the day. Absolutely. And it's the weirdest thing. <laughs> the people that you wouldn't expect yeah, yeah. are the people that came back. <laughs> yeah. That was, that was the weirdest part of it all for me. But the one thing that I learned in that moment is no one will love, care, appreciate, respect you more than your family mm. or more than the people that you've grown up with. You know, for so many years, it's like I was trying to run away from my family. I was trying to be this person that I wasn't wholeheartedly that I wasn't. I was trying to rebel. But then the second that I would soften and admit where I'd fucked up, admit that I wanted to change without fail every single time, my family have been the first people to put their hand up and say, we see this in you. We recognize that you're not this version of yourself. You're the version that we we birthed pretty much you said earlier that you had a surface level relationship before going to prison with your parents and uh, ultimately your sister especially after the sexual assault and all the things that happened there and then getting involved in drugs and everything else can you remember that first open chat that you had with mum dad family absolutely um funnily enough it was probably just on two weeks before I was arrested in 2019. So I chose to leave the syndicate mainly because I was waking up every day with this like crazy anxiety as if someone was like stepping on my chest every morning without failure. So I was forever messaging the syndicate saying, listen, can't come in today. I'm sick or coming up with an excuse. I've got an event. I've got this, I've got that. And I'm trying to tap into this feeling being like, why am I feeling like this? And I was like, oh shit, like this is, this is wrong. What I'm doing. This is, it's not okay it's by guilt, any means. Guilt, it was the guilt. It was the guilt. <laughs> Didn't realize that it was actually the guilt towards my family mm. that I'm living. I was literally living two separate lives. It's like I could, all of my friends knew what I was doing. My partner knew what I was doing. Family did not. I think I was telling them I was an Uber driver or I was working in childcare. Like there was just excuse after excuse after excuse. So I was speaking to my roommate at the time. Um, and I said to her, like, I don't understand what's going on. She goes, well, it's cause you're not real with your family right now. Like you, you need to come clean anyway. So, uh, on my phone one morning, one of my other friends sends me an article and it was of one of the one of the members of the syndicate getting done. But he was a kingpin. So in my mind, I thought, oh my God, I'm sweet. Like, everything's fine. God took care of that. Like, I'm all good. So 
I still went home and told my parents, you know what, I think it, it actually was my birthday. It was my birthday weekend. I went back home to my parents' house and said, I need to tell you something. And yeah, so I sat, I sat both my mum and my dad down and I said, listen, this is what I've been doing for X amount of months. Um, obviously, I couldn't really justify a reason as to why I was doing it. I just admitted to them that, look, I wanted to come clean. I want to start fresh with you guys. And this is the only way I know how to do it. They weren't actually surprised, which is the worst part. Mm. They sort of figured intuitively, they thought we knew you were getting up to something. We just obviously couldn't put a pinpoint on what it was, but we're glad that you've told us what, what's the exit plan? You know, how are you going to get out? How are you going to handle the situation? What are you going to do? Obviously there's that fear-based element of they're not idiots. So if you leave the syndicate, what happens? This, that, the other. So this is where I got uh, my ex involved at the time and sort of asked him to sort of orchestrate the situation of me leaving the syndicate, which he helped massively in that moment. But um, from there, <laughs> I kind of thought I'd gotten away with it. Like I was sort of like, okay, cool, clean slate. Yeah, like karmically, I'm right. In your mind, you're like, I came clean. I've, I've changed. I've come clean. Like, I've come clean to the people anymore. that matter the most. You know. Yeah, but ultimately, couldn't give still, a shit about this. You still committed a lot of crimes. Exactly right. I was like, okay, I've done. I've done. You know, the right thing here. I've come clean about everything. So that's it. End of the day. A few days pass. Again, I'm sitting on my lounge um, in my Bondi apartment, and I see I'm on a, a bottom level apartment at this time. And I've got a balcony. I've got the blinds shut, just open about this much. And so I see these two guys walk past and just pop their head over. Mind you, I'm scroll like I'm currently trying to book flights to Bali. Like I was trying to get the fuck out of here. Um, see these two guys pop their head over, and then within seconds they're knocking at the door. I thought it was Strata. So I'm living with my best mate at the time. We're housing a very large pit bull in a Bondi apartment, and we were telling Strata that it was like a little chihuahua. <laughs> So, yeah, we thought it was Strata, stressed out, hid the dog, opened the door, and sure enough, it was Croydon Police. And then, yeah, that was it. The rest is history. Yeah, then the journey started. During your prison sentence, was there anyone that you, like, really connected with that was, you felt like, okay, they've, they're essentially, you'd felt like they'd turned their life around as well, and you were trying to, you know, I don't know, create a, some sort of normality with, in that crazy zoo of a place? Unfortunately, yes. I mean, things kicked off to a really rough start. Jail was not easy for me for about six months or so mm. until I actually learnt how to play, I guess, the, the game. game, you'd call it. Or just how to stick to yourself. Look, I went in trying to fly under the radar. I since came to the realisation I'm never going to fly under the radar. So if I can't stand down, I'll stand up. So I thought, you know what, fuck it. I'm going to be a voice for a lot of the girls in here. This is where I started trying to get education, going for the girls' programs, fitness programs, literally whatever I could. From there, I really appreciated my own time. And a lot of the girls at this moment in time had figured out that I was a homebody. I needed, I, I had the only um, singular cell in my house, I guess you'd call it. I was up at Kempsey at this time. And so... Everyone knew in my house from 3 p.m. my door was closed. If I was reaching out to the outside world, you leave me alone. If I was studying, you leave me alone. And then this one girl hit the compound one day. And I don't know what it was. It's like she had chosen in that moment that I was her target, that she was going to be, I was going to be her best friend. And that was the end of it. Didn't have a say in the matter. So there were days, for example, I'd come home from work, 3 p.m. hit, I'd want to slam my door shut, lock it. I went to go do that one day and the door came back at me. The lock had been removed from my door. I was like, what the fuck? Like how, who? I went off thinking it was the officers, you know, thinking that I'd lost like that privilege. So I'm screaming around the house, trying to find this lock. And I walk into this girl, she's in the laundry. And she said, you'll get your lock back when you stop shutting us out. And that absolutely hit home for me. For me, because I thought, okay, I see what I'm doing here. You know, I'm I'm focusing on the wrong things. Like now it's it's my time that I get my head in jail, that I actually start connecting with these girls. 
And I did exactly that. There was probably only about three or four girls that I really connected with because there are so many smart women in prison. There are so many women that want a better life for themselves. But at the end of the day, it falls back on self-worth. Everyone could sit in there and talk shit about all of the amazing things they want to do when they get out. You know, all the opportunities that they have and who they think they are and, and what they're capable of. But the second you come out here, if you don't feel worthy enough to make that happen, mm. it's not going to happen. And that's something that I'm driving to all of our young people at the moment. Everything for me derives from self-worth. Right? So it's not earned. Self-worth is not earned. It's something that we learn to understand within ourselves. So that's something that I tried to start driving in jail. Anything that I could could do just to get the girls moving. We did Zumba classes, for God's sake. Like anything I could to show these girls that it's okay to put yourselves on show. It's okay to have fun. It's okay to forget where you are for like five minutes. You if know? that can't, if Zumba can't knock the violence out, right? Of it, <laughs> exactly <can>. right. <laughs> exactly right. And it was the best place to do it. You know, Kempsey for me, it didn't even feel like jail. Mm. You know, this is where opportunity started happening for me. This is where I actually started figuring out who the fuck I am again after ten years of not knowing. You know, there were days out here. I remember I used to YouTube. I one day YouTube the question, how do you figure out who you are? Because I knew, I knew that I was stuck in this cycle of, I was a shell. I didn't feel like I had an identity without drinking something or taking something, you know? So in there, it's like every single day I had the opportunity to decide who I am and who I'm going to be when I leave. They say it's a hard place to be by yourself because probably what you were doing during those 10 years were covering up and trying to be the fun person by taking the drugs and going to the parties and drinking and doing whatever else it was when actually sitting by yourself was probably quite a difficult thing to do obviously until you went to jail but I always say to people not necessarily meditation because some people that's, that's too far of a step right for some people I don't meditate myself either but <laughs> Charles Missy, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but going for a walk by yourself, it's, it's trying to ask yourself those questions of what is it that I want to do? What do I want to achieve? Who do I want to be? And it's having a conversation with yourself. They say that you'll meet your best, you know, you go to coffee with your best friend. You'll ask them how their day is, what they've done this week. But it's very difficult for us to do that and ask ourselves those questions. So trying to get people to sit there and form their own identity especially during your early 20s and like I, I truly don't think that you're an adult at 18 at all like you're kind of like in this in-between phase right where you're just trying to figure all this shit out yeah and then you realize that no one really has their shit figured out at all um but it is it is hard to sit there and, uh, and be honest with yourself about what you want to do and also then be confident enough to then actually go and execute it whilst everyone around you has tall poppy syndrome and they're trying to whack you down, you know, and bring you back down to their level again. And it's very difficult to break that cycle. It is and it still is. And this is a stigma that I want to change is that so many people think that you reach this pinnacle in life that you've got it all figured out. Why? Because that's how 90% of ourselves present ourselves on social media, that we figured it out. We know who we are. We're confident. We're this, we're that, but it's not. It is literally something you have to work at every single day. The biggest thing that helped me in there was the amount of time that I had to reflect. Every single day I was writing something. I was thinking about an event that happened however many years ago I was thinking about how that day went. I was talking to myself, like you said, like you would speak to a friend at coffee. People sitting outside my cell probably thought I was fucking crazy because <laughs> I'd have these conversations out loud with myself. But it's something you need to do. Unless you get to know yourself, how are you going to get to know yourself? How are you going to figure out who you are unless you actually have these hard conversations with yourself? Mm -hmm. Which is what I didn't do for 10 years. Like you said, I whether it be from other people creating that label or creating that label myself, I had this party girl thing attached to me. 
that I was the fun time, that I had my shit sorted out, that everything was sunshine and rainbows for me, you know, that I was always trying to better other people. Why? That was a facade. I never wanted to look inward. I never wanted to face my own demons. Mm. I couldn't rip those band-aids off. I wasn't ready to deal with it, you know? So going to jail, you literally have no option other than to face yourself, to meet yourself. Jail obviously ended up being one of those godsends that you don't see coming, right? You leave. What, what are you thinking in your brain that you're going to do as your next direction? I definitely had a lot of plans to paper. Um, a big part of it was creating more opportunity within corrective services for women because so many people, and I experienced it and understood it so well in there, everyone forgets that females fuck up as well. Everyone forgets that females go to jail or that we need help as well. Obviously, we're the nurturers of the world, but a big thing I learned for myself in there was that we do need help, not necessarily in there. Pre-intervention's great, but it's it's the coming out, it's the transitioning that a lot of females need help with, mm. myself included. So this is what was really cool about the situation was that I felt that I was almost like my biggest student. I could trial and error, see what works for me versus what didn't. So it was awesome to sort of have those realizations every day of, okay, from start to finish, officers would come to your cell in the morning, do muster, you'd eat, you'd go to work, you'd do this, you'd do that. And I'm like, okay, how would I do this differently? If I was in charge, how could I better this for the inmate, right? Because the one thing I learned in there it's not about rehabilitation at all. It's pure punishment. They don't give a shit about you. They don't care what your life looks like on the outside or is going to look like on the outside. The main theme I saw, particularly at Kempsey, there were so many officers that went into that industry for the right reasons. They do want to help. They felt like they had the capability of helping because their brother, cousin, whoever had been to jail, they know what that life is like. They know how to help. But then you get stuck in this system where you try and make a move, you try and make any noise whatsoever, and you get told no. You get shut down. And that's exactly what happened to me. I was forever... The second day I landed in that jail, I spoke to the official visitor because I was like, this isn't good and that's good. That's not good and this is... Blah, blah, blah. Like I turned into the Karen of Kempsey, basically. I said, you know, this is what needs changing. How are you going to fix it? And so I just thought, fuck it, I'm going to run with that. I know I've got a voice. A lot of these women don't have voices or don't recognize what they actually want or need. I'm going to do my best to make it happen. Mm. However, I was in green. So it's like, obviously I had limitations. There was only so much I could do. So now, or upon my release, I basically thought, okay, mad. See corrective services in a year's time from now. I want to bring education. I want to start a not-for-profit. There's so many programs that I want to bring into prisons to basically help female and males restart their lives, realize their value, realize their worth. Everyone forgets, you know, when you're, when you're coming out of jail or when anyone's coming out of jail, 90% of these people do not know what a real job looks like do not know what a stable environment looks like, do not know what a healthy relationship looks like. So it's like, how do you expect these people to then join a program to make them job ready? You're going to sit there and help them write a resume to do what? Half these people don't even know what a normal life looks like without a serious addiction. Mm. You take all of these things away from them, but it's like there's, there's no real helping element there there's no genuinity it's like okay cool we're going to get you job ready and ready for the community but without any real help there needs to be like trauma-informed care there needs to be a different level of understanding and this is why i joined confit because we've all walked that path we all know what so many of these people are experiencing and what they feel 
not only when they're in jail, but when they're released and we know how to help them. We basically set the blueprint for how you can turn your life around. I've done it. Five of the other mentors have done it. So yeah, we're basically, Confit was a godsend for me. It, it just showed me that there's so many other like-minded individuals that want to help other people realize their full potential. Mm. And just because they've gone to jail or have made one bad decision that probably the majority of people have made but have just never been caught, you know, we want to show these people that there is another life. There is more opportunity. You just need to actually believe it for yourself. Um, talk to me about the programs that you're running now, you started to run, and what's involved in some of these programs. Yep, so being with Confit now, we have been a fully functional commercial gym for the last eight weeks. Uh, we're located in Parramatta. So it's awesome because we can get the community in. Uh, we're class-based. So we run about 12 classes on average each day. However, there is the social impact element. So we basically help young people transition uh, out of juveniles. Uh, and we basically create that pathway for them. So whether it's a pathway to another form of employment, housing, that's basically us. We're the, we're the middleman, we're the mm. plug. Mm. Um, but not only do we do that, we also run our programs in juvenile centers. Uh, we first started with males. So I know the CEO, Joe, has been running that now for the last five years. Uh, we're in there weekly. Um, we basically run like a 45 minute fitness program, which we have found to be really effective because for some reason there's transferable skills in fitness, right? So it somehow manages to break down all of these barriers and creates like this weird element of trust, you know? So you can't just go into a juvenile center and talk to these kids that have years of trauma to say, oh, okay, we're here to help you fix your life. You know, mm. if we don't have that lived experience, if we don't connect with them in some other way, they're just going to think we're some other fucking program that is just there for numbers, you know. But doing these fitness programs, it's so effective. I can't even describe the feeling you have. So, yeah, we, we train for 45 minutes and these programs are not for the faint-hearted. One of the first few programs I did with the kids or young people, sorry, 300 burpees. Like what female do you know that does 300? That's ridiculous anyway, but teach us so many things. You know, I had all these young people screaming at me cause I didn't, I could not finish. I was going to vomit or cry. There was so much going on. I was screaming at all of them. Come on, miss. Like you can, you can go like, keep going. You can do this, blah, blah, blah. So you're doing this with them as well. You're, absolutely. We are. We have to, we have, we have to set the tone somehow, yeah. you know? And so after these ridiculous workout sessions, we sit down and we mentor. So we speak about our experiences, how we turned our life around, but then obviously we've, we've got a certain structure. So our main structure, we speak about the G code, right? So as criminals, obviously we all live by a certain code, whether that be don't snitch, don't talk to police, whatever else. So we've created this thing called the G code, which stands for gratitude, goal setting and being grounded. So each week we speak about what that means to us, how we've utilized uh, all of these, all of these things to better our lives and how these young people can use these to better their lives, use these values, right? So, and it's awesome. The, the, the engagement we get is so special. It's something that I could not have ever imagined before. I can see your eyes light up as you talk about it. Cause yeah, you look, Real shit for me. So starting at the gym, mind you, this coming from a girl that would not even go to work three days in a row before going to jail. My work ethic was, it didn't even exist. So now working at the gym six days a week, it's amazing. Hanging out with the community is amazing. Building that community within our gym, people that have similar values to us is insane. However, over the last few weeks, I started to lose, I guess you'd say like a sense of purpose or a sense of direction. I didn't just want to be another PT. I know that my passion lives within helping these young people. And that's exactly what I'm doing now. And so going back into these juvenile systems and what was really special for myself and 
my female co-worker Moana, we actually started our first female program uh, at the female juvenile in uh, Campbelltown last week. So that's kind of just recalibrated, you know, this new sense of purpose. So we're really excited to see where this goes. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to... I want to end on something <clears throat> and I want you to think about it. So don't feel like I have to rush. You okay. can pause. Um, I want you to think back to 14 year old Danielle and I want you to give her a little bit of advice about what her future might be like. What would you say to her? Nothing's going to prepare her. Nothing I say is going to prepare her for the path that she's about to go down, but everything was for purpose. You know, I lived mindlessly for 10 years, wondering where I fit in, wondering what my direction is, wondering if this shit is ever gonna make sense one day. But the biggest thing I could have told my 14 year old self is that you never reach a specific day where everything magically makes sense or you suddenly figure out who you are. It's in every single day, you get that one percent. You get that one percent more. I'm not really making sense. You it's get okay. that. You get that sense of surety. Only one percent more every single day. You know, every night that I go to bed, I recognize. Okay, I did this today. I did that the day before. I did that the, the day before that. It's really holding on to those small and special moments that's going to head you in the right direction. Not focusing on, okay, what you have to do tomorrow. What's going to kill you in four or five days from now? Oh, like I have to do this again. I have to, I have to go to work. I have to do this. I, I have to do this. I have to do that. Rather than thinking of, holy shit, all of my past trauma, every single thing I have encountered, whether it be bad or good, has now brought me to the person I am today and is only taking me to the person that I want to be. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, I think you're doing amazing thing. Um, you know, they say in darkness, there's always light at the end of the tunnel, right? There so, has to be. <laughs> uh, I think I think you're doing an amazing job. I'd love to, in some form, be able to help you guys in, in any way that I can. I'll put all of your details in everywhere that we possibly can throughout these um, videos and podcasts and hopefully we can have you back on again yeah absolutely. Um, and maybe get a couple of other colleagues on as well and that'd and be talk the best um, fam. <laughs> but yeah honestly amazing i think you're doing a great service and uh yeah kudos to you thank so, you so um, much thanks for coming on the pod thanks for having me it's all good no worries <laughs> like and subscribe thanks for watching